Welcome to this module of the Library Law course, part of the State Library of Iowa's endorsement program. This module is an overview of legal considerations when serving families in your library. I'm Mary Ann Morey, consultant for Central District with the State Library of Iowa. And I'm Mandy Easter, law librarian with the State Law Library of Iowa and State Library Consultant. Our learning objectives for this module are to help you review your library's policies that address common so-called problem behaviors, to apply three legal or practical actions to deal with difficult library situations, and to examine your responsibilities regarding minors who visit and use your library. Let's dive right in with our first learning objective about reviewing library policies that address so-called problem behaviors. Although we are mentioning the word policies in this module, this class won't be going into details about how to write policies. There's another module in another course that will cover that topic. But we will remind you that your library's ordinance, that legal document that stipulates the authority of your library board, gives your trustees the authority to approve policies for your library. It is the director's job through the actions of all staff to ensure that the library's policies are enacted and enforced. Let us also remind you that per the accreditation program standards, your policy should be reviewed by your library board every three years. Library policy should be proactive, meaning they anticipate and address problems before they occur. Examples of library policies that help with this aspect include policies about unattended children, inappropriate behavior, which is everything from inconsiderate to offensive to dangerous, and unreturned materials. All this being said, Mandy and I presented another webinar a few years ago about serving patrons with mental illness. In that session, Mandy gave us a warning about our policies. Library policymakers need to consider how current and prospective rules may impact patrons with mental illness. Noise policies, loan periods, and other library rules need to be crafted to ensure the smooth operation of the library, but those same rules should not be so stringent that they alienate patrons with mental illness. Instead of seeing policy modifications as exceptions with negative connotations, frame them more positively as accommodations for a disability. After all, mental illnesses are recognized by the Americans with Disabilities Act as disabilities, so public libraries must attempt to accommodate patrons with both physical and mental disabilities as much as possible. For instance, if a particular patron is convinced that others are trying to look at his computer screen, is it possible to put him in a room by himself? A patron who talks to herself may be exhibiting a common symptom of mental illness that can run afoul of noise policies if that talking becomes distracting to other patrons. It is appropriate to inform or remind her that the library has a noise policy and that she's making too much noise, but the librarian can truly accommodate this patron by offering to let her use a study room or move to a place in the library that's more conducive to noise. A common symptom of mental illness is a problematic memory. In one library, a patron was coming in almost daily to work on a long-term research project involving non-circulating reference materials. He was using the same sources, but had difficulty remembering the names and locations of those sources. A staff member decided to keep the books on a library cart so he could retrieve them more easily and quickly. She also wrote down the titles for him in case they got reshelved. These are just a few examples of modifying library policies so that they become disability accommodations. There are obvious ways to have good or bad library policies. Let's look first at what might constitute a bad library policy. This information is based on a document from the Wisconsin libraries. A library policy is bad if it is vague. For instance, if your policy says, if a patron has too many overdue books, that patron's library privileges may be revoked. How many is too many? Another way to have a bad library policy is if it violates other laws. For instance, having gun bans initiated only by the library and not dictated by the city, or failure to serve certain groups. Example, no religious groups allowed to use the library's meeting room. Unreasonable policies are obviously going to be bad policies. Imagine a policy that mandated no talking in the library. And yet another way to have a bad policy is to develop one that is unenforceable. For instance, no one under 14 may use the library's Wi-Fi. 
Think of all the cell phones in pockets and backpacks. How could library staff ever enforce such a policy? On the flip side, there are some basic ways to develop good library policies. Warren Graham in his book, The Black Belt Librarian, says policies should be clear, concise, and consistent. Thinking back to, back to that vague policy we mentioned in the last slide, it could become a clear policy by changing it to state. If a patron has 20 overdue books, that patron's library privileges may be revoked. Concise means the policy is easy to understand, not too wordy. Think of the no shirt, no shoes, no service policy that most restaurants have. That's a pretty good example of being concise. Consistent means your library is enforcing the policy for all library users, not picking and choosing to whom the policy applies. If you're not willing to enforce the policy for all users, don't have the policy. Policy writing can be tricky when it comes to finding the right word. This is especially true when we start talking about problem situations or problem patrons. The first thing we want to do is address the common use of the phrase problem patrons, especially in light of those patrons who may have mental disabilities. In, in 1888, American author Mark Twain wrote to his friend, the difference between the almost right word and the right word is really a large matter. It's the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. The words we choose to describe something can affect our perception of that thing. Now, granted, most librarians who assign the term problem patron to a particular person do so without any malice and simply mean to convey that a particular interaction or situation requires special attention or consideration. Using such a term can be cathartic, but it only exacerbates the pain and frustration of mental illness and further stigmatizes those who suffer from it. I know we tend to categorize our patrons into descriptive groups, and certainly any member of any group could cause a problem in the library, but merely being a member of a group doesn't in and of itself amount to a problem. Furthermore, a patron who doesn't fall into any group is just as likely to cause us a problem. Perhaps we should think of the situation as the problem or challenge rather than the patron himself. It's the actions of our patrons that can sometimes cause problems, not their mere presence in the library. We want to avoid labeling groups of patrons or patrons who fall into a particular group as problematic. Supposedly, there is a point balance between one person's pleasant environment and another person's offense, but the courts have often have to settle those disputes on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, people aren't allowed to break the law in a public building, so they can be kicked out of the library for being drunk, disorderly, using drugs, carrying an open liquor or beer bottle, participating in a physical altercation, stalking or harassing someone, being naked, carrying a knife or brass knuckles, etc. Other than that, I find little support in the law or case law for rejecting taxpayers from tax-supported institutions except for the most egregious offenses. Our second learning objective will help you apply three legal or practical situations to deal with these difficulties at your library. It seems that many librarians or their boards, sometimes both, think the easiest way to deal with the problem situation is simply to ban the patron from library access. Can a library legally ban someone from the library? Well, since this issue is not directly addressed in either state or federal law, nor do I find it addressed by the American Library Association, the only guidance comes from the relatively few court cases in which a banned patron sued a public library for violating his First Amendment constitutional right to use the library. Federal courts have ruled in favor of a public library conduct policy that results in patron bans when the following conditions are clearly met. Number one, the policy is written to include specific behaviors that are particularly egregious and will result in being banned from the library. Note that the length of time ban does not have to be specified in the policy and can be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Generalized statements relating to conduct are legally problematic. Number two, the behavior guidelines must be considered reasonable to the average person. Number three, the guidelines cannot be arbitrary or discriminatory. They shouldn't target a legally protected class of people, even inadvertently. Number four, 
the banning progress must be progressive unless the behavior presents an immediate and profound threat to other patrons and or staff. Violent or clearly criminal acts have been cited as acceptable reasons to forego progressive discipline. Number five, fair notice must be given to both adult patrons and the parents of minor patrons in the form of registered letters of warning, preferably two or three, de detailing the conduct policies that are being violated, documenting the date or dates on which the violation or violations occurred, and stating the consequence if violations continue before a ban is instituted. And number six, there must be an appeal process in place. Typically, the Board of Trustees hears appeals through which the ban can be reduced or vacated and the patron must be notified in writing of the procedure to follow. I could not find any public library issuing lifetime bans, so those may have already been determined to be legally problematic by city attorneys. Typically, libraries' maximum bans are one or rarely two years, with most finding that one day to three month bans are most effective. It seems that the majority of public libraries have ethical issues with banning juveniles for longer than a month, no matter what they've done. And most find workarounds, such as allowing the child to come into the library during the ban if he comes with a parent or guardian. Many libraries include a statement in the ban letter indicating that the patron may continue to use his public library by sending a designated surrogate to the library with his library card and a list of materials wanted or needed. A second situation deals with overdue fines. Over the course of the past few years, there has been a push for public libraries to eliminate their traditional practice of charging overdue fines to library users who do not return books by the due date. Studies have shown that overdue fines are a barrier to library use for many families, particularly families with limited budgets. When a library patron realizes she'll be charged $5 or $10 if she returns the stack of picture books she checked out for her kids, she may be tempted to instead not return the books rather than incur the fines and subsequently will stop visiting the library. Even if she returns the books, the accrued fines may be enough to stop her and her children from ever visiting the library again. Right here in Iowa, some libraries have made the decision to eliminate overdue fines. From this article, Cedar Falls Public Library Director Kelly Stern said, fines are not the most effective way to manage borrowing and are not fair to low income patrons. We understand that life happens and that it can be difficult sometimes to return items on time to the library, she said. The announcements from the two libraries came a little more than a week after the board of the Lawrence, Kansas Public Library voted to end fines for overdue materials. And I'm quoting from this article you see on the slide. Current fine-free libraries report increased visits and circulation, as well as an increase in the return of long overdue material, said the library director from, uh, from Iowa. Fees for lost or damaged items will remain and patrons with overdue items will be blocked from checking out further items until the overdue material is renewed or returned, but they don't incur any fines. Waterloo Public Library Director Nick Rossman said 30% of its patrons under 18 were unable to use the library because of fines. These fine-free policies will reduce barriers to access while also including measures to protect library materials, he said. But what about making people be responsible for city-owned property? People won't return anything or will consistently return things long overdue if the library doesn't have fines, right? Wrong. Many libraries have already eliminated overdue fines and have seen extremely positive results from the new freedom. Here's what happened in a Chicago library, according to a story that aired on NPR in late 2019, which you see on the slide. Lifting fines has had a surprising dual effect. More patrons are returning to the library with their late materials in hand. Chicago saw a 240% increase in return of materials within three weeks of implementing its fine-free policy last month, or the, right after the month that they implemented that. The library system also had 400 more card renewals compared with the same time in the previous year. Here's some situations that may prove to be difficulties for you at your library, but we're going to provide you with some better solutions to help you deal successfully with these issues. Language barriers. 
If you have people who have speech difficulties or who are English language learners or who may have an accent you're unaccustomed to hearing, you could have difficulty understanding the person's needs or you could have difficulty explaining yourself to the patron. Here are a few tips that might help. Speak slowly. Use basic words and sentences. Avoid colloquialisms and cliches. Accompany your comments with hand gestures to help explain. Write your words as well as speak them. Apologize that you are having difficulty understanding. Go get a coworker to assist. Physical difficulties or disabilities, be accommodating without being condescending. Go through your library from the view of any disabled persons who may visit your library and see what limitations you face and if there are ways to eliminate those obstacles. Be willing to ask the person, how can I better serve you? Mental disabilities. Consult a local mental health organization for assistance with understanding the situation and to learn suggestions for how to interact with the person. If possible, talk with the person's caregiver about what services the library can, or in some cases cannot, provide. Odd questions. This might be something along the lines of the person who asks you a really tough reference question and keeps coming back wanting more and more information and you struggle to find the kinds of answers the person needs. Or think of the person who brings in that new e-reader that he or she just received as a gift, and the person expects you to format it and make it usable, set it up for use. Again, it may prove to be difficult because of the level of expectation on the part of the patron and the level of ability, resources, or staff time you can offer. Consider having policies about lengthy reference questions and or offer to set up a specific appointment time with the person when you can devote a certain amount of time with the person to help with the need. Mandy has a good story about her difficult situation with the library uh, patron and a better solution she found for handling the difficulty. When I worked at a large public library, the same patron came in every weekend to ask for directions to Middle Earth. After the first couple of unsuccessful and hostile interactions with him, I learned not to argue about the likelihood of the existence of Middle Earth and the availability of directions to get there. And mind you, this was before the internet. So I eventually just copied some pages from the World Book Encyclopedia about the center of the Earth and handed them to him, a copy every week. He seemed grateful and would leave the library without incident. This brings us to our final learning objective, examining aspects of your responsibilities regarding minors in your library. When discussing these kinds of topics, we first need to cover the legal term in loco parentis. In loco parentis means in place of a parent or acting as the temporary guardian of a child, taking on all or some of the responsibilities of a parent. The U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that during the school day, a teacher or school administrator may act in loco parentis. By the way, this may be a good time to reiterate the answer to a question we get a lot. Library directors, library staff, and library trustees are not mandatory child abuse reporters. However, they can report suspected abuse or neglect of either children or dependent adults just like anyone else can. Mandatory reporters carry a great deal of legal liability for their employers, so it's actually a good thing for cities that librarians do not have that particular legal duty among all their other varied duties. The law does not expect public library staff to act in loco parentis the way that teachers do while children are in school, so there isn't a legal obligation for librarians to monitor the safety of children in the library. However, when children are registered for library programming, the library is legally responsible for their safety for the duration of the program. Both public and private organizations are legally liable for providing reasonably safe environments for members of the public, protecting them from foreseeable harm, and preventing their unreasonable exposure to danger. It would seem prudent for libraries to post signs in the library proper as well as on the library's website that make it clear the library staff cannot and does not monitor the well-being of unattended children in the building. Take every opportunity to educate your city's parents about the library's unattended children policy. Regarding sick children left at the library, I often hear librarians state matter-of-factly that they tell ill children, teenagers, and even adults to leave the library and come back when they're well, 
or they tell me they've posted a sign on the library's door that says, don't come in if you're sick. Librarians really have no right to do either of these things. A few years ago, during the state's flu epidemic, several librarians asked us whether or not they could legally force obviously ill patrons to leave the library or post a sign asking them to stay out of the library to begin with. We researched the law and consulted with the attorney for the Iowa Department of Public Health, who in turn consulted with the Iowa Attorney General staff and reported back to us that it was their collective opinion that such attempts would most likely be rebuffed by the courts. The Department of Health's attorney's advice was that since many contagious illnesses are not accompanied by symptoms obvious to the untrained eye, as well as the fact that many illnesses are most contagious before symptoms appear, and conversely, many illnesses are no longer contagious once symptoms appear, it is impossible to know who is actually spreading pathogens. So any denial of a public service based upon a layperson's assessment of such threats has the potential to be unfair, discriminatory, and ineffective, as well as a legal liability to the public employer. Now that said, it may be possible to hold accountable parents and caregivers of ill minors and dependent adults who dump their sick charges on the public library. Some libraries have inserted phrases such as these that you see on the slide into their unattended children, safe child, or dependent adults policies. You can see various statements that might be included in your library's similar policies. A few years ago, the topic of truancy came up on our state discussion forum for librarians, and it seemed to be a hot button, especially after one librarian shared that her library's policies, policies stated no kids of any age could be in the library unattended during regular school hours. The librarian said she would contact the truancy officer if kids were in the library during school officers. And you had some pretty strong recommendations regarding this topic, Mandy. Well, experts agree that this type of public library policy is not acceptable for many reasons and leaves cities vulnerable to litigation. Truancy falls under the jurisdiction of school districts, which are actual governmental entities, not cities. Libraries are poking their noses where they don't belong. The Iowa Supreme Court ruled in 1994 that even police officers do not have the authority to investigate, apprehend, or transport suspected truants. So for sure, librarians do not possess the knowledge, training, skills, authority, or student-specific information required to involve themselves in truancy issues. The first time I encountered this question, I solicited the opinions of the general counsels for the Iowa Department of Education and the Iowa League of Cities, as well as a private tort attorney. All three agreed that librarians should not act as truant officers and any such judgments regarding the motives of library patrons were legally risky for their cities. Unattended children is probably the most common problem parent issue that librarians deal with, which is why we're devoting a fair amount of time to it in this module. The unattended children problem can range from parents who dump their kids off for library programs without staying in the building themselves to parents who are in the building but not actively monitoring the actions of toddlers. When I was a director, I instructed my youth services librarian to go ahead and post notice in our publicity announcements regarding children's programming, most notably regarding story times for preschoolers, that parents were expected to remain in the classroom with the child because the information we were sharing there was designed to encourage parents to continue the education at home. This is more effective when you describe your story times as early childhood literacy classes, but that's another whole topic. It's very important to have an unattended children or safe child policy for your library. Whether you have an old policy that you suspect needs updating or you have to write a new one from scratch, there are many resources available to help you get it right. First of all, don't reinvent the wheel. There are plenty of well-vetted examples out there for you to customize or copy. My philosophy is that it's best to look to larger public libraries policies because larger municipalities have dedicated city attorneys who are available to critique their library's documents when asked. And consequently, their policies have likely already been vetted by an attorney. Public libraries post their policies on the internet, so search for them online by subject or go to particular libraries' websites and look at their policies. It's typically okay to look at ones from other states, too. Most policies will say that children under a certain age, usually at 7, 8, or 9, must be accompanied by a person who is at least a certain age. Think older sibling or teenage babysitter, such as 12, 13, or 14. 
If you insist that particularly young children must be accompanied by their parents, you will see your door count drop dramatically and unnecessarily so. There's no legal reason to demand that parents are present. Such policies are exclusionary and possibly discriminatory. And usually these policies don't come into play unless a child is being unruly anyway. It's not as though you're going to stand at the door and look at the birth certificates for every child coming through it. You're only going to encourage the age policy when you have a problem. Let's talk a little bit about privacy and confidentiality for minors since it ties in with this in local parentis concept. According to Iowa Code Section 22.7, the following records shall be kept confidential unless otherwise ordered by a court, by the lawful custodian of the records, or by another person duly authorized to release such information. The records of the library, which by themselves or when examined with other public records, would reveal the identity of the library patron. Mandy and I covered this chapter in our module about laws for libraries. You can also learn more about patron privacy in our endorsement class about intellectual freedom. An opinion of the Iowa Attorney General dated September 30th, 1980, defined the lawful custodian of library records by this. The lawful custodian of library circulation records is the library officer or employee entrusted with the responsibility to make and maintain such records. Ordinarily, that individual would be the head or chief librarian or person occupying a similar position in each specific library where circulation records are maintained. This means the library director is the lawful custodian of public library records in Iowa. Even though the director is the lawful custodian of patron library records, all library employees should keep what patrons have checked out private because it's the law. A common question we're often asked is about the privacy and confidentiality of minors' library records. If a, pair, if a parent comes into your library and asks what is checked out on their child's library card, what do you do? Don't rely on uncertainty. Know well in advance how you will deal with these kinds of situations and be proactive about solutions. Iowa Code Section 613.16 16 says that parents are liable for the acts of their children. At the same time, section 22.7, subsection 13, protects the confidentiality of all library patrons regardless of age. So parents are liable for the acts of their children, and yet children are included in the right to have their library records kept confidential. Obviously, libraries are in a difficult position as a result of these two Iowa Code provisions. As noted previously, Iowa Code Section 22.7 does allow for discretion on the part of the custodian of the records, who is the library director. In other words, the Iowa Code gives the library director the authority to decide whether or not to release library records. If records are requested by a criminal or juvenile justice agency, the library director may release the records only upon receiving a court order. The board should adopt a confidentiality policy, which designates the library director as the custodian of the records and states when the director may release them. Some Iowa libraries will not release a child's records to a parent under any circumstances. Others will release them in certain situations. To protect intellectual freedom, library boards should err on the side of confidentiality. Releasing the records of a library patron, regardless of age, should be the exception rather than the rule. For example, if a three-year-old has checked out a number of books and the parent wants to know the titles to be sure all items have been returned, many library boards would find it reasonable to release the titles. However, the older the child is, the more difficult the decision becomes. If it's a 14-year-old child who's checked out books on child abuse or alcoholism, most library boards would, without question, protect the child's confidentiality. A parent who wishes to know what a child has checked out has at least two options besides asking the library director for the child's records. A parent could simply ask the child what's checked out or require the child to check out materials on the parent's card. As the American Library Association points out, a great deal of angst can be avoided by clearly notifying parents of the library's privacy and confidentiality policies during the process of issuing library cards to minors, including printing a brief statement to the policy's effect on the registration itself above the signature line, or asking parents to acknowledge receiving the information by initialing the notice. At that time, if they're uncomfortable with the policy, give them the option of checking out their children's books on their own cards. 
Give them every opportunity to prevent a problem so that if a meltdown occurs, they have no one to blame but themselves. This whole concept of parents not having the right to know what's on their child's library card is a really touchy one, especially since at most libraries, a child cannot get a library card without a parental signature. So the parent has to sign and provide accountability of those library materials the child will check out, yet the parent has no right to know what the child has checked out. Parents sign for a library card because the registration procedure represents a legally binding contract between the library and the private citizen who plans to borrow the city's property, library materials. The law of contracts says that contracting with a minor is risky, since a legal defense to a minor's breach of contract is that the contract was, well, a minor. Therefore, conventional wisdom says it's best to contract only with adults. Since the law holds parents responsible to an extent for the acts of their children, they can be forced to pay their kids overdue fines, fees, and the cost of lost or damaged items. If parents didn't sign their children's registration cards, it might be difficult to recover any costs from the minors themselves, depending on the circumstances. That said, I'm aware of several public libraries in our state that don't require parent signatures on registrations for patrons who are at least 10, 11, or 12 years old in order to preserve minors' constitutional right to use their libraries and to counter some parents' reluctance to accept financial responsibility for what their preteens and teens might do. Librarians prevent or limit teen debt by restricting teens' access to more materials once any items are overdue. Teens can volunteer at the library to work off the cost of overdue, lost, or damaged items, or they can pay cash for them, since most have access to money from gifts, allowances, odd jobs, or part-time employment. Experts agree that alienating preteens and teens from libraries has long-term effects on both the teens and the libraries, and they recommend that librarians and trustees take precautions to prevent that from happening. Only you, your staff, and your trustees can decide what will work in your community. Oh, and along with ensuring that parents understand your confidentiality policy, make sure preteens and teens understand their privacy rights as well. Obviously, as Mandy mentioned in a previous slide, there's a huge difference between a parent asking about their three-year-old child's library records and their 13-year-old child's records. Here are a few practical ways library staff may deal with requests from parents regarding their child's records. And as Mandy said, it's up to you and your board to determine best policies and best procedures for your library and your community. As Mandy said, you can ensure that your library card applications clearly state that the library will maintain confidentiality of the child's records. Make sure this is obvious to the signing parent when they apply for their child's library card. Generally speaking, if the child is old enough to get to the library alone, such as by walking or riding a bicycle, then that child is old enough to warrant complete confidentiality of his or her records. A toddler obviously needs a parent or adult to get him or her to the library. If your library is automated and parents can access their accounts online, encourage the parent to sit down with the child and access the account together online. You can teach the parent how this can be done from the library's website. Simply have the parent bring the child to the library and together request to see the account. You may also determine that you'll print a receipt of the child's checkouts, put it in a sealed envelope, and mail it to the home. In 1972, the American Library Association adopted its interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights entitled Free Access to Libraries for Minors. That's now entitled Access to Library Resources and Services for Minors which says library policies and procedures that effectively deny minors equal and equitable access to all library resources and services available to other users violate the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights. The American Library Association opposes all attempts to restrict access to library services, materials, and facilities based on the age of library users. Children and young adults unquestionably possess First Amendment rights, including the right to receive information through the library in print, sound, images, data, games, software, and other formats. Librarians and library governing bodies have a public and professional obligation to ensure that all members of the community they serve have free, equal, and equitable access to the entire range of library resources, regardless of content, approach, or format. This principle of library service applies equally to all users, minors as well as adults. 
Lack of access to information can be harmful to minors. Librarians and library governing bodies must uphold this principle in order to provide adequate and effective service to minors. And we just want to make sure that you take note that the library's Bill of Rights does talk about age. The Library Bill of Rights should govern the ethics of librarianship, and while we might feel more confident about providing access to books and other physical materials in our library, there are many libraries that have policies requiring parental consent for a minor to be on a public com computer. According to the Library Bill of Rights, though, such a requirement is an infringement upon minors' rights to, to information and violates their intellectual freedom. That's correct. According to our profession standards bearer and our country's federal courts, public libraries should not require parental permission for minors who want to use the library's public access computers or their Wi-Fi services for the minor's own devices. Maintaining a system by which a parent can prevent a 17-year-old from using the internet puts the library in a legally vulnerable position and should be discontinued. That's an extreme example, but the concept applies to children of all ages. Do not contract with parents regarding their children's choices. Requiring parental permission for minors, especially teenagers, to use any information resource at the public library violates the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights, as well as the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The rights of minors to retrieve, interact with, and create information posted on the Internet in libraries are extensions of their First Amendment rights, according to the federal courts. The rights of minors to use the internet, whether or not their parents permit it, is a legal intellectual freedom and privacy issue. The federal courts have ruled that minors have the same right to confidentiality in their uses of a library that adults enjoy. As far as the library is concerned, if parents want to restrict their children's usage of library materials and the internet is just another information resource like a book or a map or a video, it is the parents' responsibility to monitor that, not the library staff's. The American Library Association states, as defenders of intellectual freedom in the First Amendment, libraries and librarians have a responsibility to offer unrestricted access to internet ac activity in accordance with local, state, and federal laws and to advocate for greater access where it is abridged. Here is a link to ALA's statement on minors and internet activity. Note that one of the first statements says, the rights of minors to retrieve, interact with, and create information posted on the internet in schools and libraries are extensions of their First Amendment rights. And here is its companion statement entitled, Access to Library Resources and Services for Minors, an Interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights, formally entitled Free Access to Libraries for Minors which warns that every restriction on access to and use of library resources based solely on the chronological age, education level, literacy skills, or legal emancipation of users violates Article 5 of the Library Bill of Rights. To clarify, these ideas are not from ALA's ivory tower. This is legal advice from ALA's attorneys based on decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court. These court decisions are referenced in this statement. You or your patrons can look them up and read them. If your library is sued for ignoring ALA's advice, the words in these court decisions will be used against you. And if you're sued for following ALA's advice, these words will exonerate you. So take them to heart. Let's finish the last of this module by bringing it all home, as the saying goes. What are some basic takeaways from all of this content? One of the first takeaways is to apply your library's policies and services to everyone the same. In his book, The Black Belt Librarian, Warren Graham suggests not only having good policies, but applying them the same to everyone. He addresses, or he stresses that you address problem patrons based upon behavior and not upon looks, much like what Mandy told us earlier when she said we should consider situations and actions and not the presence of the people themselves. Graham also talks about the importance of all staff consistently following and enforcing library guidelines. Staff needs to be on the same page. Don't let the public think that some staffers aren't following the same library established rules. Stay on top of the enforcement every day. Don't ignore a situation if it's in direct violation of your library's policies. 
Maintaining the library's policies across all segments and situations will help ensure a pleasant experience for your patrons every time they visit the library. Here's a general list of tips for communicating effectively with difficult patrons during those difficult situations, including those that may have a mental illness. It's important to balance their rights with the rights of other patrons and staff, and these tips can help with that. These are communication tips that can help you and your colleagues work effectively and serve all your patrons. These methods are recommended by mental health and security experts. Most of these are self-explanatory as you can note them on the slide. It is important that you be aware and communicate. If someone seems to be acting oddly, wait and observe. Talk to other staff. They may be familiar with the person and know the best way to approach him or her. Sometimes one staff member seems to have a knack for dealing with a particular patron, so if possible, he or she should consistently approach that patron. Otherwise, it's frequently helpful to confer with other staff on duty about how best to handle a given person or situation. However, most often the person will come and go without incident. If a behavior needs to be addressed, use teamwork. No one should feel alone on the front lines. Call on another staff member to back you up. Often, a united front will be enough to convince an unruly patron to either change or leave. It's very important not to allow staff to be bullied. The administration and staff must back up each other. When dealing with any patron's questionable behavior, introduce yourself and try to get the person's name. Be polite. Try a lighter touch first. Start by saying, I noticed that, or the reason I'm here is, or you may not be aware of this, but the library has a policy about or I need to ask you to, further on in the conversation, these phrases can have a calming effect. I can see that you're upset, or I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make you mad, or you could be right, or it's not me, it's the computer, or please help me do my job for you, or I can take your name and number from my supervisor if you'd like. Assess the seriousness of each situation as quickly as possible and look for clues about the patron's likely course of action. Does the person's body language convey anger or cooperation? Move a little closer to build rapport. Stay back if you sense anger. Use space and distance and available barriers such as a desk, a large chair, or a countertop to reflect the patron's attitude. Take immediate action when you understand the problem. Ignoring a problem doesn't make it go away. On the contrary, it will likely grow. Trust your intuition. Don't rationalize irrational behavior. Respect patrons' privacy. Have a discreet but safe place to talk if necessary. Listen carefully to the person's words. Ensure that he or she knows you're paying attention. Clarify the patron's messages. Make sure you understand what's being said. Permit verbal venting when possible. Let him blow off steam. Respect personal space. Don't stand too close for comfort. Avoid physical contact. Do not push, grab, or otherwise touch the person. Be aware of body position. Don't stand directly in front of a person or appear to block his avenue of escape. This concludes our module about serving families. We hope this information will help you serve the residents of your community well.